Professor Briggs is a prolific scholar who is well known for her contributions to the study of gender, race, and empire. Her books include Reproducing Empire, Race, Sex, Science, and U.S. Imperialism in Puerto Rico, and Somebody's Children, The Politics of Transracial and Transnational Adoption. As a first year Puerto Rican graduate student, I hunted down my first copy of Re Reproducing Empire, and ever since, it has held a special place on my bookshelf and in my classroom. It never fails to spark lively discussion, and some of you in here might have um, had that book with me in class. However, it is Professor Briggs' new book, which she will discuss today, that has now taken hold of my imagination in exciting ways. In how all politics became reproductive politics, from welfare reform to foreclosure to Trump, she tells a story that helped me make sense of the past very difficult year. By showing us a reviewer, as reviewer Eileen Boris notes, how questions of care stand at the center of politics. In this book, Professor Briggs chronicles the fierce defeats faced by communities in the US, both com poor communities and all communities, as she shows, by the push to privatize reproductive labor. She shows us how this drive has been at the core of neoliberal politics in the 20th and 21st centuries. But she doesn't stop there. Rather, this is at its heart a story that illuminates the centrality of reproductive politics to social movements, social movements often led by women and people of color over the generations. These movements demanded and continued to demand care and dignity for communities in the face of violence, abandonment, and austerity. And it is through Briggs' illumination of what she calls an activist politics of reproductive justice rooted in these earlier struggles, that her book provides an accessible, exciting call to agitate for change. This is why this book is one that I look forward to passing along to friends, discussing with colleagues, and to teaching. Please join me in, warm, in warmly welcoming Professor Laura Briggs to the stage. Thank you, Emma Amador, for that amazing introduction. Actually, now that she summarized the book, we can all just go drink, right? Um, we don't actually need to do the talk. No, and, um, and look for Emma's own work, which I have found invaluable as well. Um, so thank you to Bonnie Honig and to Tricia Rose, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. It's my great honor to be here. Um, also, Christine Downs, who managed to um, get the logistics together in spite of my um, overwhelming unresponsiveness to email. Um, so, I want to start by telling you a story, because the book begins by telling stories. Um, and I had to think of new stories that I hadn't already told in the book. Um, but when I was 15, my boyfriend was on welfare, the government program for poor kids and their moms. My own family wasn't that much better off. One of the things Kevin and I had in common was that we were both the children of single mothers. When Ronald Reagan was running for office in 1979, the thing I remember most vividly was that Kevin started repeating Reagan's lines about welfare cheats and women who drove their pink Cadillacs to the liquor store to cash their welfare checks. And I distinctly remember thinking two things. One, you're selling out your mother, and two, you stupid racist, this is a trick to make you think you're better than someone so you'll take food out of your own dumb mouth. You won't be surprised to learn that the relationship didn't last. <laughs> Although we did, he did finally actually come around and see the error of his ways and we're actually still friends. So more unfortunately though, in the intervening 40 years, the US Republican Party hasn't changed, particularly in how it makes white people like Kevin think through racism to vote against their own best interests. On the contrary, they've turned Reagan into a hero and followed his formula for slashing government programs. And while I'm happy to support the people who keep saying that Trump's presidency is not normal, as long as it's a good tactic to keep people riled up and resisting, and in some ways it is true, he seems intent on dividing the Republican Party to the breaking point, 
Um, the argument I want to make today is that the racism and misogyny that brought Trump to power in the United States is, sadly, the regular and unsurprising face of the Republican Party, and that the kinds of families that Kevin and I grew up in are under insanely more stress than they were in the 1970s. Relative to the cost of living, wages have gone down since then, and while our moms kept body and soul together through wages and public benefits with enough time left over to be around for us a lot, now welfare is mostly gone, and they'd be much more likely to be working two McJobs, our moms, in fast food or at employers like Walmart, or maybe Kevin's mom would have had to go back to being married to his father who beat her up. And while a lot of people would like to lay this changed state of affairs at the feet of the Republicans alone, I have to begin by admitting that the Democrats have not been a whole lot better. <clears throat> One way to describe this problem is to say that it's about privatization. The privatization of care work and other reproductive labor, whether that's for women, and usually it is people understood to be women who care for children, elders, or others who can't care for themselves. Privatization is why we have fewer elder daycare programs, public housing units, or welfare benefits for those who have to do the labor of caring for others, including children. In fact, US government reports on who, is, who does child care find even minimum wage workers paying someone else for childcare um, for preschool aged children or, their elder, or to get their elderly disabled mom a lunch while, or help to the bathroom while they're at work. That payment may be informal, swapping babysitting for example, which is about time, but it increasingly is likely to involve actual money. In addition to care, the other thing that's been privatized is wealth as government and public policy have been less and less inclined to break up monopolies, regulate corporations, or even recognize that they're not people, or more recently to acknowledge that since corporations don't go to church, it's hard to understand how they can have religious convictions as US courts and government policies have claimed. Instead, we have a huge and growing wealth gap that's been produced by declining wages, fewer good jobs with decent benefits, the gutting of labor unions, regressive taxes, um, which is about to get a whole lot worse. As I wrote this, I didn't quite believe that that tax bill was going to pass, and maybe it still won't. Um, the gutting of labor unions, regressive taxes, and as a result, the concentration of wealth among the 1%. So one of the names of this process of the privatization of wealth and care is neoliberalism. We in the US call it Reaganomics, we used to, and now we just call it the free market. Another name in play, the one that animated Trump's 2016 political campaign, um, calls it globalization, the concern that free trade agreements and the concern about free trade agreements and immigrants. But that's an oversimplification of what's changed in the last half century. And that word globalization is very interesting because it was also chosen by the campaign to gesture toward the anti-globalism of the white nationalist right in the United States. The fear of world government that reaches back historically to the John Birch Society's opposition to membership in the United Nations. And so of course this is a mystification. The real problem is not so much free trade per se, much less immigration, but rather the broader neoliberal system in which it is embedded. Neoliberalism was a political revolution that began in the late 1970s in the United States and earlier elsewhere like in Latin America, in which multinational corporations and international financial systems have reset government priorities to shrink spending on the well-being of actual humans, from housing to schools to child welfare programs in order to keep corporate taxes low and profits high. Tax cutting and budget cuts are the end result of a struggle to make government smaller and to de devolve its responsibilities onto families and other civic institutions. 
Conservatives began during the Reagan administration to really succeed in privatizing dependency, making children, elders, and the well-being of households and communities into an individualized problem. So today, I want to track privatization in the United States across a series of political gestures involving a kind of moral discourse about families. My argument is that by persuading some people who think of themselves as white to regard families of people of color as morally inferior and frankly disposable, US Republicans and Democrats alike enacted neoliberal policies that benefited Wall Street and the 1% and harmed all sorts of families and households. And while the details and chronologies are different in Europe and elsewhere, I'm not tracking a process that's unique to the United States. Far from it. On the contrary, the ways that white nativist nationalism is consolidating around fear of black folks, immigrants, refugees, and other minoritized groups and the suggestion that there's something deviant about their families is sadly anything but a local US story. I'm thinking of the virtual criminalization of Muslim modest dress in the name of secular civil society, the fear of immigrants' large families and many children, and other disparagement of ragged children living off other people's taxes. I think the value of walking through the steps that led to the neoliberal and Trump revolutions in the United States particularly as they were enacted in and through families, is that I actually hope it suggests a model for how to do this kind of analysis in relationship to other peoples and other places. So let me start with welfare reform as a policy narrative that spanned the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations, and then turn to immigration, detention, and deportation. That really began under Bill Clinton in an episode that got called Nannygate that focused on household workers, appropriately enough since that's the labor that a huge number of immigrants are doing, particularly care work. The third event I want to track is the foreclosure crisis in which millions of people were put out of their homes through predatory loans and sometimes outright fraud by banks and financial services industries. The effect, wait, that's not right. Hmm. Oh, yes it is, sorry. The effect of all of this, which I'm only gonna nod to in this, ta in this talk, but would be happy to talk about more afterward, are, in, are a number of significant changes in households that are reflected also in the diminished dreams and goals of US social movements. One is at least a temporary defeat of a feminist vision of multiple kinds of households queer, single mothers, collective households, communities that share care work and other reproductive labor, supported through a combination of living wages, affordable, reliable, and collective child care, high quality, affordable health care, and short work days. And in conjunction with the labor movement, the 40-hour work week that's largely been left behind now. Or we could look to the Black Panther Party and its breakfast programs, liberation schools, free clothing programs, and health clinics, and see a vision for human well-being that had a great deal in common with feminisms. Likewise, we could see a gay liberation movement that dreamed in collective households and families of affinity, not just biological relatedness, and reproduction in many wild combinations. These have been reduced to terribly foreshortened fights for abortion and birth control, against violence by the state and police, and for gay marriage, because abortion and birth control are increasingly hard to get, and half the country thinks they're illegal, because a fascist formation in US police departments thinks they're on the front lines of a racialized war, because the queer families we choose have been systematically brutalized by separating parents from children, lovers from those who care for them, while ill in the name of legal marriage and real families. So as neoliberalism has sucked most of the air out of alternative visions of household and civic possibilities, we've fallen back to defending the bare survival of families and communities and far smaller dreams of freedom 
As debt and economic precarity creep steadily up the economic ladder, we are collectively having children later and later, and people are increasingly using a wretchedly expensive and not very effective hack, reproductive technology, to overcome the structural infertility that long periods of education, repaying loans, and getting established in jobs and housing impose on us. Or some people are turning to transnational adoption. While decades of research has persistently told us it's riddled with exploitation and unsafe practices, unfair practices. While ReproTech is used widely across class and racial difference in the US when people have good health insurance, as in the military, in the broader society, of course, there's significantly unequal access. And while working class families, communities, and households in the US may not be facing the structural infertility of later childbearing, there's significant evidence that their infertility rates are much higher, and the disparity in infant mortality and miscarriage rates have only grown in decades that have continually pushed wealth up to the 1%. Let me start with Ronald Reagan. In the 1980s, government was seeking ways to sharply curtail its responsibility for household security, impoverished communities, and reproductive labor. What I mean by reproductive labor is simply the work required to have a next generation, to provide gentle and compassionate care for elders and others who cannot always care for themselves, which is to say all of us at some point. <clears throat> it can be unpaid labor by family and household members or paid work in homes, hospitals, nursing homes, and daycare centers. It also includes the work of community building, networks of care and concern across neighborhoods, towns, or communities of affinity, like Latino communities or gay communities. So as I was suggesting, the welfare queen was a cover story for reducing government programs in general. It was stunningly effective. Newspapers, pundits, and policymakers caricatured welfare recipients as lazy, sexually promiscuous, and scamming the government. It became easier for others to have contempt for them. So in the 90s, under Bill Clinton, the conservative wing of the Democratic Party, the Democratic Leadership Council, piled on. Through welfare reform, both major US political parties began to roll back security for families and time to care for others. Dependency was a key word in welfare reform, but it was actually used to refer to caregivers not children, other, elders, or others who needed to be cared for. President Bill Clinton claimed that welfare reform would, quote, transform a broken system that traps too many people in a cycle of dependency to one that emphasizes work and independence. If you were, say, a child and couldn't work, oh well. Given the US's long and tortured history of producing racial difference as a way of naturalizing unfreedom and bad wages while giving permission to heap contempt on those who were victimized by slavery and poverty, it was not surprising that the political move that ultimately ensured that work hours would expand, wages stagnate, and time for care work evaporate was one that painted care work black or to a lesser extent Latinx or native, depending on what region of the country you were in. Although people of color were never the majority of welfare recipients, white children were, 62% of recipients were white, welfare was made into a black women thing. Even as white women as a group lost the most in welfare reform, they got the one bone that's always been thrown to white working and middle class people in the United States the opportunity to feel that they were morally superior to people of color. When welfare was reformed, the big winners were the companies that created McJobs, the fast food industry, Walmart, and other low-wage employers, including states that paid starvation wages to attendant care workers for people with disabilities and family daycare providers. Welfare reform also pushed mothers into low-wage work at a time when the value of the minimum wage in the United States was declining sharply. 
In constant dollars, minimum wage hit its high point in 1968. By 1989, it was worth 40% less. <clears throat> It be, as it became more and more impossible for mothers to support themselves and their children on low-wage work, 40 hours a week of minimum wage didn't pay rent and groceries, never mind health care and child care. As a result, it became clear that if business was going to get the most it could out of the potential workforce in the United States without raising wages, it was going to have to eliminate welfare and force impoverished mothers into jobs. The result, in 1997, the year that legislation to end welfare as we know it went into effect, Walmart became the largest employer in the United States with three quarters of its workforce female. The irony is that only by a particularly narrow definition does a Walmart job actually get you off welfare. Walmart encourages its employees to, to apply for government benefits. And Walmart and other minimum wage workers and McDonald's and similar McJobs are the largest group of Medicaid and food stamp recipients in the United States. So that's to say that U.S. taxpayers subsidize Walmart paychecks and corporate profits by paying welfare benefits to its workers and their children. Welfare reform eliminated virtually all education and job training benefits beyond marriage classes and work readiness classes that taught women to stay married, dress nice, and get the kids up early. The result, women couldn't get the education to get a good job, and they were still receiving welfare benefits, but they could be counted on to clock regular hours and make profits for their employers. Whipping up racial resentment of mothers who were staying home with their kids, especially mothers who weren't married, and rendering them shameful, crazy, and pathological did a great deal to scare others into not acting like that, not applying for benefits for fear of being called ugly names or worse, to risk losing their kids. It also provided an illusory white privilege. White women agreed to be pushed into the labor force to submit to having no time or resources to care for dependents and to lose the one program that might help them if they had to leave an abusive partner or even one who was just unloving. In exchange, they got to believe their families were superior to families of color. While people were looking at all these supposed welfare queens and newspapers who were writing stories about black teenage mothers and welfare-dependent families that suffered from multi-generational mental illness, Reagan's administration eliminated many popular programs that provided public benefits to support households and communities. It reduced housing subsidies and put people out of their homes, cut aid to cities, including for transportation, elder daycare programs, and job training, presided over pervasive redlining and racial discrimination by banks, real estate agents, and landlords monitored by the federal government, and top officials at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, shifted funds for <clears throat> housing subsidies to wealthy developers. They slashed low-income housing assistance, also known as Section 8, and then blamed the people who were pushed out of doors, saying, quote, people are sleeping on the grates, the homeless are homeless, you might say, by choice. Or even better, it blamed welfare. Commenting on the sudden appearance of homeless old ladies in Reagan's America, Lawrence Townsend, the much lauded director of the welfare program in Riverside, California, said, every time I see a bag lady on the street, I wonder, was that an AFDC mother who hit the menopause wall and can no longer reproduce and get money to support herself? Meanwhile, the institutionalization of people with mental illness continued to pace. Hundreds of thousands of people went to live in the streets. People who would otherwise have left stayed with abusive partners for a modicum of economic security. And former welfare recipients wore all of these faces. The 1980s saw the beginning of a massive upward redistribution of wealth that's reconstructed class relations in the United States, reducing mobility from the working class to the middle class. Welfare was a convenient alibi at the moment U.S. corporations were taking well-paying manufacturing jobs offshore 
and wages were being driven down, and millions of people were being driven into the service sector, flipping burgers, selling the clothes Walmart was manufacturing in Guatemala and Vietnam, and cleaning homes and buildings, and that work was often part-time. But even at 40 hours, McJobs offered neither livable wages nor health insurance. As an added bonus, as the Fight for 15 campaign reminds us, they often came with substantial amounts of sexual harassment. The new right led with reproductive politics as a way to direct public attention to teen mothers while fundamentally reshaping government. The welfare reform discussion that began under Reagan provided the cultural cover to instantiate this massive economic restructuring and it involved a deliberate policy-driven shift in political power away from unions, people of color, and women to corporations and the wealthy. It was mobilized in ways that particularly affected women and people of color and traded on negative stereotypes of those groups to affect its changes while not seeming callous. The poor, it told us, were responsible for their own poverty through their bad choices involving that frequent object of horror in U.S. society, rampant teenage sex. If all those slutty girls would just keep their legs shut, it insisted, however implausibly, there wouldn't be poverty in America. In 1993, we got a, meta, we got a snapshot of how neoliberal shifts in the relationship between households, wages, and public benefits were being lived by families of different classes in the United States. In the weeks before President Bill Clinton's inauguration in 1993, he announced his intention to put together a cabinet that he said would look like America by including women and people of color. His female nominees didn't fare well, though, because of a new spotlight on a practice that had become quite common among families of the CEO class, hiring undocumented nannies and housekeepers, which was taken to be a problem of mothers in particular although an uncounted number of fathers were appointed to prominent positions without any inquiry into their family's childcare arrangements. The nomination of Zoe Baird, Clinton's pick for attorney general, turned into ground zero for the new anti-immigrant forces. She had readily admitted in the vetting process that she had two household employees, a nanny and a chauffeur, who were undocumented because she was sponsoring them for green cards and it was not against the law to employ workers who were undocumented at the time that she hired them. That was a Reagan era event. <clears throat> it never occurred to her, Clinton's team, that she had committed more than a technical violation of the law. It was compared to a parking ticket. She paid a fine and some social security taxes and that, they thought, was that. It wasn't. As the Clinton administration was about to find out, immigration was landing as a crisis of white nativism in U.S. politics. The bipartisan agreement on immigration reform of a few years earlier that had legalized undocumented immigrants was giving way to ever more punitive calls to deport people and to militarize the borders. The privatization of care and steadily expanding work days meant that households like Baird's were hiring undocumented immigrants to do their reproductive labor. Immigration enforcement was keeping migrants trapped in those jobs, and immigrants themselves were supposed to either have no households or keep their children, elders, and other dependents in home countries. <clears throat> so this assumption that Zoe Baird had done nothing really wrong in hiring undocumented immigrants as household workers turned out to reveal a significant fault line in U.S. political culture. The nomination blew up. There was a huge backlash against Baird and another presumptive nominee, Kimba Wood, who had hire, also hired an undocumented housekeeper and nanny. Middle class folk, mostly women, overwhelmingly struggling with inadequate daycare arrangements didn't just resent impoverished welfare mothers, but they were also brimming with anger at the relatively small number of the very wealthy who could afford nannies in that at that time. So the Census Bureau estimated 6.2% of households had nannies in 1987. So Baird was the perfect target for their anger, too. Her close ties with big business and Washington insiders certainly didn't help her case. 
The complex stance of white class-based resentment worked a little differently in the anti-immigrant fervor mobilized by the Baird case than it had in relationship to welfare. It was the abject exploitability of immigrants that was infuriating here, as it had been throughout the 1970s and 80s as unions had raged helplessly against the offshoring of manufacturing and the shift to ever lower wage sites. While household laborers were certainly not taking union jobs away from anyone, except insofar as they made well-educated, often white women, available to the labor force, their position as the lowest paid laborers was perceived, rightly or wrongly, to be depressing wages across the board. A follow-up New York Times article in January 1992 explored the rank exploitation that often characterized these relationships. It found that nanny placing agencies in that city were quite open about offering mostly undocumented women as employees, and that legal was a commodity that people could buy. Quote, the reason pe that people hire immigrants without papers is that they're looking to save. If they want legal, they can get it, but it costs. Nedra Kleinman, who ran the All Home Services Agency on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, told the New York Times. While occasionally an employer would actually help workers go to school, find apartments, get situated as legal workers, sponsor them for green cards, it was mostly a utilitarian arrangement. Employers would offer to sponsor workers for green cards and got women who were trapped in live-in arrangements with low wages in exchange. One woman in Queens told the Times quite bluntly that she was looking for an illegal immigrant who had not been in the country long to care for her newborn triplets. Quote, I want someone who cannot leave the country, who doesn't know anyone in New York, who basically does not have a life, the woman said. I want someone who is completely dependent on me and loyal to my family. Now, one wonders what kind of loyalty she was likely to buy from someone who she was clearly seeking in order to exploit. This kind, but this kind of arrogance, more broadly, didn't play well in white middle America. Despite the presumptions of this well-off and frequently exploitative class, Baird's nomination and Wood's near nomination went down in flames. Baird and Wood never did work in government, and male nominees faced a decidedly different landscape with respect to household or child care no arrangements. Trump's nominee for Commerce, now the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, sailed through confirmation hearings last year after admitting that he had recently fired an undocumented housekeeper. The sea change in the relationship of government, business, and citizens in the United States that accelerated under Reagan, Bush, and then Bill Clinton shifted the cost of reproductive labor from government to private households. At the same time, the business was taking more and more labor time away from the household by drawing mothers into the workforce without providing childcare, for example. By the 1990s, this neoliberal shift in state, household, and business relations was producing a broad crisis of reproductive labor that families and households solved in different ways depending on income and their place in the global economy, but that a considerable number of people resolved by offshoring household and care work. That is, some hired nannies, housekeepers, and home care workers from Mexico, Central America, and elsewhere in the global south. These migrant care workers themselves often felt compelled to globalize their own reproduction, leaving children or other dependents in home countries where their very low US wages could provide for their dependents, offering financial support to caregivers, building houses, sending children to schools, even to college. Immigration reform in the 1990s made this caregiving workforce precarious by making people illegal and even sometimes stigmatizing their employers. And I talk at great length, what I'm missing here is the story of what happened to Zoe Baird's employers, employees, the Corderos, who were hounded out of the country um, by the INS. By the end of Bill Clinton's presidency, after nearly a decade more more of neoliberal policies and depressing immigrant wages, having a nanny or house cleaner to fill in for the steadily eroding time for care had been broadly democratized, 
affordable for an ever broader swath of the middle class. Even after the increasing alarm about security and foreign nationals in the United States that began in 2001, spread for no clear reason to Latin Americans who were doing the lion's share of paid household labor, the major thing that all this securitization seemed to do was harden a labor process that was already well underway, to make it more difficult for migrants to keep their children with them, minimize their labor protections, and offering immigrant labor to fill the care gap in U.S. households at ever lower wages. Finally, I just want to nod to the economic meltdown of 2007 to 2011. U.S. banks found themselves with too much cash lying around as the economy superheated in the 1990s with globalization abroad, low wages at home, and increasing numbers of women and immigrants in the workforce. With the easing of banking regulation under first Clinton and then Bush Jr., they began making ever more aggressive and predatory loans to put all that extra cash to work for them and figured out how to persuade even people who already owned homes to borrow money against them. They and their math whiz bully boys created loan instruments that were so complex that even former Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan admitted that he couldn't understand them. They then foisted them off on people who could at least be said to have less than perfect credit scores and called them subprime loans. One former loan officer admitted, though, to a reporter that in the industry they used subprime as a demographic category to describe people of color in particular and women in general who could be talked into taking crappy loans. Although we don't know for sure, many critics have said that it sure smells like loan officers also put their thumbs on the credit rating scales, as women with the same incomes as men got worse loans, even though women on average have better credit scores. We also know that people of color overall got much worse loans from income-matched white folks. Not surprisingly, it was women of color looking to get into the housing market, single moms in particular, who were most overrepresented among those who got subprime loans and got foreclosed on. And while I don't have time to go there, they even foreclosed, they even got foreclosed on when they didn't, when they weren't behind on their mortgages, which is what we learned from the scandal that briefly halted foreclosures in 2010, the robo-signing scandal of false and forged documents by the banks. The whole thing was welfare reform redo the households of single mothers torn up by a scheme to make money for the 1%. The Obama administration did somewhere between nothing and very little to help the people who lost everything in the crisis. His Treasury Secretary, Timothy Geithner, all too briefly made headlines when he admitted that the administration's program in response to help home homeowners, HAMP, the Home Affordable Modification, yeah, that never seems like English to me, which is why I use the acronym. The Home Affordable Modification Program um, was really designed, in his phrase, to foam the runways for the banks, to keep them from crashing by spreading out foreclosures so there weren't too many at any one time. Not fewer foreclosures, just slower foreclosures. The call by those on the left of the Democratic Party to adjust mortgages to reflect what people's homes were really worth rather than have them continue to pay based on the inflated prices of the housing bubble that the banks produced. As Geithner admitted in the same meeting, he and, Obama, he and Obama's people thought that such a program, which would have refinanced mortgage principal, would bring all sorts of people into the program who weren't distressed, weren't at risk of losing their homes. Never mind that such a program would cost a fraction of what the U.S. was spending on a boundless war on terror. CNBC's Rick Santelli, reporting from the Chicago Commodity Pits, apparently didn't get the word that the Democrats were never going to refinance principal, and made the conservative case against refinancing mortgages when Obama's bailout was announced in 2009 in what was later billed as the rant that launched the Tea Party. Government is promoting bad behavior. Do we really want to subsidize losers' mortgages? This is America. How many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage? 
President Obama, are you listening? How about we all stop paying our mortgages? It's a it's moral hazard. While the conservative National Review cheered Santelli, and Wall Street Journal had been writing articles to this effect for quite some time, Charles Demos at the progressive blog My Direct Democracy called Santelli a racist. And it's worth listening to his words at length because Demos understood immediately what he was hearing and where we were headed. After watching the Santelli clip, I first had to check my calendar, he wrote. Somehow I felt I'd traveled back in time to the early 1970s to witness firsthand Richard Nixon's northern strategy, his pursuit of white ethnic voters who were so deeply disaffected over great society programs ranging from desegregation, remember the Boston busing madness, to affirmative action among others that they would desert the Democratic Party, becoming Nixon's silent majority and then Reagan Democrats. He continued, Rick Santelli is heir to this legacy laced with racist overtones. Fear mongering, it's worked before, so let's try it again. It's back to the 1970s for the GOP and their rabid white ethnics. Conservative news outlets like Fox News and the Wall Street Journal, Journal were blaming illegal immigrants and subprime loans on black and Hispanic borrowers. The Tea Party was born in part out of the demand that all these unworthy families, many female-headed, be put out on the street. That government aid to, these conspic to those conspicuously badly treated by the banks was just another giveaway to poor people. It was a preview of the Trump electoral strategy. It was a preview of what happened subsequently to Puerto Rico. And it was the third and final chapter of the story I'm telling about how Democrats and Republicans work together to give us the horrors of our current neoliberal crisis of neither enough money nor enough time to care for ourselves, our communities, and those who cannot care for themselves through a racist story about the immorality of certain families. In an effort to end on an up note, <laughs> Let me say a few words about what I think this means about where we should concentrate our energies. First, no currently existing political party in the United States is gonna be the answer to this problem without a major reform or takeover by different political elements. They both got us into this. Nevertheless, there are social movements in the US that are doing crucial work in the opening provided by the crisis in both parties. Black Lives Matter, with its broad anti-racist, queer, trans, and feminist leadership and politics, is providing a real model of organizing. Fight for $15, seeking to raise wages across service and related industries, again with women and queer folk in its leadership, and also critically addressing sexual harassment and violence, is doing amazingly important work. The fight for immigrants that was mobilized through, um, through DACA and DocuQueer and no ban, no wall, no raids is also powerfully and broadly progressive. The black freedom movement, immigrant rights and labor activism for the 40 hour work week and other fights for leisure time and time to care for dependents were crucial in the 1970s mobilizations that pushed for government and business to pay for the survival and thriving of families and communities. Trans activists are doing deep and profound work in undermining the gender binaries that authorize conservative versions of the weaponized nuclear family that allow people to continue to deny decent wages and benefits for households that don't look like that. However, there's still two major missing pieces in my mind. One is a sustained and vigorous feminist movement as such. When we look at the 53% of white women who voted for Trump and an even higher percentage for Roy Moore, we're talking about the failure of feminism to reach the majority of white women. We're getting our butts kicked by the radical Christian right and their vision of women, gender, and sexuality, just as Phyllis Schlafly won the day against feminism a generation ago. The radical Christian right is closer to power than it has ever been before. Mike Pence's targeting of birth control, abortion, maternity care for poor women, trans folks, and gay people in general should dampen any feminist calls for, Trump, for Trump's impeachment. 
Then there's Jeff Sessions. Oh, good, I cut off the. Their heads got cut off in the in the transfer over email. I can't say I'm sorry. I should be. All right. So that's Jeff Sessions and Betsy DeVos. You know what they look like. Um, there's Jeff Sessions' Handmaid's Tale style crusade to make Christianity the law of the land. Betsy DeVos's effort to redirect public money to religious schools and segregation academies, also known as charter schools. And a host of people at Health and Human Services who are seeking to outlaw abortion, limit access to birth control, and minimize claims about, race, about rape and sexual harassment. But this is also an indication of the way forward. While feminism is winning on social media with hashtags like Me Too, and right this minute in traditional media as well, there's a lot of work to do to build the face-to-face -face commu feminist communities and organizations that are really gonna change hearts and minds. What media creates, it can destroy, and a genuine grassroots movement has more staying power. Lastly, I'm really missing the left feminist queer movement that was such a crucial part of my own political formation that was anti-imperialist, anti-racist, and feminist. Fights over HIV AIDS and then gay marriage really sucked the wind out of its sails. We need it back more now more than ever for its creativity, humor, and above all, for its expansive ability to reimagine sex, relationships, and households. Also, without anti-imperialism, there really is no hope for addressing our neoliberal impoverishment. If we want to realign government and business priorities from feeding wealth and war to paying attention to humans, we have to begin by stopping the longest war in U.S. history, which I'll just you know, piss off everybody by saying was the real weakness of the Bernie Sanders movement. Among. Finally, in spite of all the ba political bad news out there, I'm actually incredibly grateful to be around in this moment. There's a broader mobilization for human freedom and meeting real humans, real needs in the US now than at any time in my life since the Reagan administration. Last month's local elections across the United States were extraordinary for the unprecedented success of actual socialists, feminists, queer, trans, Black Lives Matter, and other progressive activists. The key is to keep building on it and moving forward. Thank you.